purple. So I'm just waiting for it to actually be showing that it's connected on my Twitch and YouTube and yada yada. Fucking technical difficulties. <clears throat> All right, looks like it's up and running again on Twitch. Let's check YouTube. How is it? All right, looks like after 44 minutes, it got cut off. All right. Don't worry, you guys. We'll go back a little bit. And um, again, that's why you guys would probably, if you guys are... Looking at my playlist, why there's like part ones, part twos of the same day of, of, um, of college for this course. I, I'm going to do my best to separate the different classes that I'm taking. So this one, for example, is art history. And it's just going to be like the way for you guys to find the correct one is one. It's going to be uploaded in order. So you guys will be able to see the oldest one first and then the lower you get it's the more current it is time wise. And also it'll be day one of of college. Day two of college, day three of college, obviously day one is older than day three, right? So that's another way you guys could uh find the correct videos and then also in parentheses that will put the class that I'm focusing the video on and then you could also you could categorize it you you'll be able to pinpoint the correct video all you guys have to do is scroll down or up and look for it anyways we'll go back a little bit and then continue if visual literacy first and foremost requires close observation, especially the apparent randomness of de Kooning's brushwork. If visual literacy first and foremost requires close observation, it also requires the ability to describe and interpret what we see. It is, in other words, a process of critical thinking. To interpret what we observe, we need, then, a descriptive vocabulary, and this chapter will introduce you to some of the essential concepts and terms that will help us the relationship among words, images, and objects in the real world, the ideas of representation and abstraction, the distinctions among form, content, context, and conventions in art. Now, <clears throat> I think I'm going to read it one more time because, yeah. You guys don't need to have like listen to it. Sometimes reading it out your guys' selves will help you remember shit. Um, all right. <clears throat> As it turns out, in the mid-1960s, the artist responsible for it, Willem de Kooning, Willem de Kooning, had moved to springs on the east end of, the Long Island, of Long Island, and this painting was executed in the studio there. He had moved there, he said, in 1972, because I wanted to give back to a feeling of light in painting. I wanted to get in touch with nature not painting scenes from nature but to get a feeling of the light that was very appealing to me here particularly if this piece of biographical info tends to confirm yeah information i get it My, sometimes i'll shorten it out info tends to confirm our understandings of the work our reading still falls short of accounting adequately for much about it especially the apparent randomness of de Kooning's brushwork. If visual literacy, literacy first and foremost requires close observation, it also requires the ability to describe and interpret what we see. It is, in other words, a process of critical thinking. To interpret what we observe, we need then a descriptive vocabulary and this chapter will introduce you to some of the essential concepts and terms that will help us. Relationships among, when you guys are reading, as long as you get, you can skip certain words. 
like the relationships among words, images, and objects in the real world, ideas of representation and abstraction, the distinctions among form, content, context, and con conventions in art. <clears throat> Words and images. What is the relationship between words and images? The Belgian artist René Magritte offered a lesson in visual literacy in his painting The Treason of Images. Magritte reproduced an image of a pipe similar to that found in tobacco store signs and ads of his time. The caption under the pipe translates into English as, This is not a pipe, which at first seems contradictory. We tend to look at the image of a pipe as if it were really a pipe, but of course it isn't. It's the representation of a pipe. In a short excerpt from the 1960 film by Luc de Huche, Magritte, or the Object Lesson, Magritte himself discussed the arbitrary relation between words and things. Both images and words can refer to things that we see or experience in the world, but they are not the things themselves. Nevertheless, we depend upon words to articulate our understanding of visual culture, and using words well is fundamental to visual literacy. In a series of photographs focused on the role of women in her native Iran and entitled Women of Allah, Shirin Nashat combines words and images in startling ways. In rebellious silence, Nashat portrays herself as a Muslim woman dressed in a black shador, the traditional covering that extends from head to toe, revealing only hands and face. A rifle divides her face, upon which Nashat has inscribed in ink a Farsi poem by the devout Iranian woman poet Tahere Shafarsadeh. Shafarsadeh's verses express the deep belief of many Iranian women in Islam. Only within the context of Islam, they believe, are women truly equal to men. And they claim that the Shador, by concealing a woman's sexuality, prevents her from becoming a sexual object. The Shador, in this sense, is liberating. It also expresses women's solidarity with men in the rejection of Western culture, symbolized by Western dress. But to a Western audience, unable to read Farsi, the values embodied in the poem are indecipherable, a fact that Nishat fully understands. Thus, because we cannot understand the image, it is open to stereotyping, misreading, misunderstanding. Yep, something is wrong with the internet. I could tell because um, on Restream.io, on my tablet, it's I could keep track of the kilobytes per second, the bit rate. If it goes higher than I set it to, that means there's something happening. So it's the internet that I'm paying for. Xfinity with Comcast. You're fucking up. I don't know why. I probably need to get my own router so I could stop having these um, issues. Alright. Looks like it's up and running again. Let me go back. And let's see on YouTube. Did they split it? Day three? Nope. All right, here we go. Sometimes, it, like it automatically spits splits it into different videos, so I have to go back and ah, re change the the freaking title to part one of two, part whatever, part three, part four, part five of the same damn video, because of technical difficulties. So let's go back. Percy, the values embodied in the words and images. The Belgian artist Rene Magritte offered in her native Iran an entire only hands and face women in Islam. That the Shador, by concealing a woman's sexuality, prevents her from becoming a sexual object. The Shador, in this sense, is liberating. It also expresses women's solidarity with men in the rejection of Western culture, symbolized by Western dress. But to a Western audience, unable to read Farsi, the values embodied in the poem are indecipherable, a fact that Nishat fully understands. 
Thus, because we cannot understand the image, it is open to stereotyping, misreading, misunderstanding. The very conditions of the division between Islam and the West imaged in the division of Neshat's body and face by the gun. The subject... Subject, literal visible image in a work of art as distinguished from its contents, which includes the connotive, which includes the connotative, symbolic, and suggestive aspects of image. <clears throat> matter, subject matter. Ah, uh, it was not subject, it was subject matter, and that's the definition of it, okay. And it repeats the matter of the work. What the image literally depicts barely hints at the complexity of its content. Content. Meaning of an image beyond its overt subject matter as opposed to form as opposed to for. What the image means. Indeed, the words that accompany a work of art, its title, for instance, as in de Kooning's North Atlantic Light, can go a long way toward helping us understand an image's meaning. In Islamic culture, in fact, words take precedence over images, and calligraphy, that is the fine art of handwriting, is the chief form of Islamic art. All right, so even though he read again, handwriting as a form of art. I need a, I have bad calligraphy skills, so I would love... The to Muslim improve, calligrapher... To improve it, sorry. ...does not so much express himself as act as a medium through which Allah, God, can express himself in the most beautiful manner possible. Thus all properly pious writing, especially poetry, is sacred. This is the case with the page from the poet Ferdasi's Shah Nama. Sacred texts are almost always decorated with designs that aim to be visually compelling, but not representational. Until recent times in the Muslim world, every book, indeed almost every sustained statement, began with the phrase Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which can be translated in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, Ever-Merciful, the same phrase that opens the Quran. On this folio page from the Shah Nama, the Bismillah is in the top right-hand corner. Arabic texts read from right to left. To write the Bismillah in as beautiful a form as possible is believed to bring the scribe forgiveness for his sins. The Islamic emphasis on calligraphy. I had opaque watercolor inking and gold on paper. Better than black and white, right? It's color coded for like ADHD or, um, yeah, ADHD. Graphic art derives to a large degree. Or dyslexia, right? From the fact that at the heart of Islamic culture lies the word in the form of the recitations that make up the Quran, the messages the faithful believe that God delivered to the prophet Muhammad through the agency of the angel Gabriel. The word could be trusted in a way that images could not. In the Hadith, the collections of sayings and anecdotes about Muhammad's life, Muhammad is quoted as having warned, an angel will not enter a house where there is a dog or a painting. Thus, images are notably absent in almost all Islamic religious architecture. And because Muhammad also claimed that those who make pictures will be punished on the Day of Judgment by being told, make alive what you have created, the representation of living things, human beings especially, is frowned upon. Such thinking would lead the Muslim owner of a Persian miniature, representing a prince feasting in the countryside, to erase the heads of all those depicted. No one could mistake these headless figures for living things. The distrust of images is not unique to Islam. At various periods in history, Christians have also debated whether it was sinful to depict God and his creatures in paintings and sculpture. In the summer of 1566, for instance, Protestant iconoclasts... Iconoclasts, literally, image breakers, those who, taking the Bible's commandment against the worship of graven... <coughs> Excuse me, images literally wish to destroy images in religious setting. Blame the soda. Literally image breakers, those who wish to destroy images in religious settings, threatened to destroy Van Eyck's Ghent altarpiece. 
but just three days before all Ghent's churches were sacked, the altarpiece was dismantled and hidden in the tower by local authorities. In Nuremberg, Germany, a large sculpture of Mary and Gabriel hanging over the high altar at the Church of St. Lorenz was spared destruction, but only after the town council voted to cover it with a cloth that was not permanently removed until the 19th century. The rationale for this wave of destruction, which swept across northern Europe, was a strict reading of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not make any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. But whatever the religious justification, it should be equally clear that the distrust of visual imagery is, at least in part, a result of the visual's power. If the worship of graven images, that is, idols, is forbidden in the Bible, The assumption is that such images are powerfully attractive, even dangerously seductive. Representation and Abstraction What is the difference between representation and abstraction? In the last section, we began to explore the topic of visual literacy by considering the relationship between words and images. Words and images are two different systems of describing the world. Words refer to the world in the abstract, Images represent the world or reproduce its appearance. Traditionally, one of the primary goals of the visual arts has been to capture and portray the way the natural world looks. But as we all know, some works of art look more like the natural world than others, and some artists are less interested than others in representing the world as it actually appears. As a result, a vocabulary has developed that describes how closely or not the image resembles visual reality itself. This basic set of terms is where we need to begin in order to talk or write intelligently about works of art. Generally, we refer to works of art as either representational or abstract. A representational work of art portrays natural objects in recognizable form. All right. Any work of art that seeks to resemble the world of a natural appearance. The more the representation resembles what the eye sees, the more it is said to be an example of realism. Realism. Generally, the tendency to render the facts of existence specifically. In the 19th century, the desire to describe the world in a way unadulterated by the imaginative and idealist tendencies of the romantic sensibility. When a painting is so realistic that it appears to be a photograph, it is said to be photorealistic. Photorealistic. A drawing or painting so realistic in appearance that it appears to be a photograph. The less a work resembles real things in the world, the more it is said to be an example of abstract art. (sighs) Abstract. In art, the rendering of images and objects in a stylized or simplified way so that though they remain recognizable, their formal or ex- uh, expressive aspects are emphasized compared both representational and non-objective art. Okay. When a work does not refer to the natural or objective world at all, it is said to be completely abstract or non-objective. Non-objective. Okay. It says, art that makes no reference to the natural world and that explores the inherent expressive or aesthetic potential of the formal elements, line, shape, color, and the formal compositional principles of a given medium. Also known as non-representational art. One second. Yochana has subscribed to you. Shout out to Yochana. Thanks for subscribing on YouTube. Now go check out my <laughs> Twitch and Facebook and subscribe or follow there too. <laughs> uh, you don't have to, but it would it would be nice. Representation and reality. Albert Bierstadt's painting Puget Sound on the Pacific Coast is representational and from all appearances highly realistic. 
However, when it was painted in 1870, a writer for the New York Evening Mail, reporting on his visit to Bierstadt's studio to see the work, worried that it might be more fanciful than realistic. It is, we are told, in all essential features, a portrait of the place depicted, and we need the assurance to satisfy us that it is not a superb vision of that dreamland into which our much-admired painter has made at least as many visits as he has made among the material wonders of the West. Bierstadt, in fact, had never visited Puget Sound, and this painting bears no resemblance to the Puget Sound landscape. Bierstadt's painting is naturalistic rather than realistic. Naturalism is a brand of representation in which the artist retains apparently realistic elements. <clears throat> a brand naturalism is a brand of representation in which the artist retains apparently realistic elements but presents the visual word from a distinctly personal or subjective point of view. Okay. In Bierstadt's case, accurate representations of Western flora and fauna, as well as Native American dress and costume, but presents the visual world from a distinctly personal or subjective point of view. In this case, a formula that he used in painting after painting of the American West. A waterfall tumbles down a precipitous mountainside into a lake, in this case Puget Sound. Storm clouds gather, light filters through from above, in fact, the play of light in Bierstadt's Puget Sound bears a strong resemblance to that in Willem de Kooning's North Atlantic Light. But where Bierstadt's painting retains strong representational elements, de Kooning's is much more abstract, as if de Kooning is engaged in a sort of dialogue between representation and abstraction. Okay, so this is Albert Bierstadt's Puget Sound on the Pacific Coast. That's pretty cool. This is oil on canvas. It's in the Seattle Art Museum. Credit gift to the front. Okay, sweet. That's awesome. All right. <clears throat> the creative process. Abstract illusionism. George Green's Marooned and Dreaming, A Path of Song and Mind. Throughout the last three decades of the last century, George Green painted in a distinct style that came to be known as abstract illusionism. It was characterized by images of abstract sculptural forms that seemed to float free of the painting surface in highly illusionistic three-dimensional space. In the last few years of the 1990s, he began to make these paintings on birch, using the wood's natural grain to heighten the illusion. It was as if one were looking at a photorealistic painting of an abstract wooden sculpture. Over the last decade, this process has evolved into a series of canvases of which Marooned and Dreaming, A Path of Song and Mind, is exemplary. Like his earlier abstract illusionist works of the late 1990s, these paintings begin with a single sheet of raw birch. Green then paints a highly illusionistic frame and mat onto the birch. The frame is an example of what we call trompe l'oeil, French for trick or deceive the eye, as opposed to photorealism, in which the painting is so realistic it appears to be a photograph, trompe l'oeil effects result in a painting that looks as if it is an actual thing, in this case an actual frame and mat. If one looks carefully at the lighter wood grain of the birch board at both the left and right edges, it becomes obvious that the shadowing created by the bevel edges and concave surfaces of the molding are painted onto the flat surface of the wood. But Green's frames are so visually convincing that on more than one occasion, collectors have asked him if he would mind if they changed the frame. They can't, of course. The frame is an integral part of the painting. The third stage of Green's process is to paint a photorealistic seascape into the frame and mat. While these seas... George Green, Marooned and Dreaming of Pathos, Song and Mind in Progress. Okay. Raw birch ground before painting. George Green, Marooned and Dreaming, A Path of Song and Mind in Progress, 2011. Second stage, painted, frame, and mat.
So I think some of the stuff that he painted looks. I don't know. I'm confused. <laughs> These scapes are based on actual photographs taken by the artist. They are, upon further consideration, anything but photographic. In Marooned and Dreaming, A Path of Song and Mind, the clouds are too purple, the sea too garishly green. The aura of the sun behind the clouds lends the scene a quasi-spiritual dimension, and the lightning looks more like airborne jellyfish than an actual atmospheric electrostatic discharge. That said... Photographs of actual lightning storms are every bit as unbelievable as these. For all its ostensible realism, in other words, the painting evokes a sort of otherworldliness. Writing about Green's work, the photorealist painter Don Eddy puts it this way, The totality has the quality of an altered state that I find deeply reminiscent of movies that are heavily dependent on CGI, computer-generated imagery. Finally, Green overlays the entire composition with a filigree of scrolls and arabesques intertwined with planes of color, globes of wood, and even snapshots of landscapes, all painted on the surface. They are meant to evoke the unrepresentable, the look of music or the flight of the mind. It is as if these elements have been painted on a sheet of glass set atop the painting and framed beneath. They create, at any rate, another surface, closer to the viewer than landscape and frame, And in their total abstraction, they insist on the artificiality of the entire composition. As Green's title suggests, the artist is alone with his own mind. And that mind works between several worlds. The world of actual objects, the imaginative dreamscapes of fantasy, and the unrepresentable sounds of song and music. These are, he suggests, the very layers of imagination. Degrees of Abstraction While still a recognizable image of a landscape, Wolf Kahn's Afterglow 1 is far more abstract than Bierstadt's Puget Sound. The painting consists of four bands of color. In the near foreground is the edge of a field, behind it a band of trees in dark shadow, and behind the trees a blue cloud and an orange-hued sunset sky. For Kahn, the less realistic detail, the better the painting. When a work becomes too descriptive, Khan told an interviewer in 1995, too much involved with what's actually out there, then there's nothing else going on in the painting and it dies on you. In fact, like both de Kooning and Bierstadt, his paintings could be said to be more about light than the actual landscape. Although Australian Aboriginal artist Old Mick Chakamara's Honey Art Dreaming is in fact a landscape, it is not immediately recognizable as one. The organizing logic of most Aboriginal art is the so-called dreaming a system of belief unlike that of most other religions in the world. The dreaming is not literally dreaming as we think of it. For the Aborigine, the dreaming is the presence or mark of an ancestral being in the world. Images of these beings, representations of the myths about them, maps of their travels, depictions of the places and landscapes they inhabited, make up the great bulk of Aboriginal art. To the Aboriginal people, The entire landscape is thought of as a series of marks made upon the earth by the dreaming. Thus, the landscape itself is a record of the ancestral beings passing, and geography is full of meaning and history. Painting is understood as a concise vocabulary of abstract marks, conceived to reveal the ancestors' being, both present and past, in the Australian landscape. Ceremonial paintings on rocks, on the ground, and on people's bodies were made for centuries by the Aboriginal peoples of Central Australia's Western Desert region. Paintings, similar in form and content to these traditional works, began to be produced in the region in 1971. In that year, a young art teacher named Jeff Barden arrived in Papunya Tula, literally Honey Ant Dreaming Place, a settlement on the edge of the Western Desert organized by the government to provide health care, education, and housing for the Aboriginal peoples. Several of the older Aboriginal men became interested in Barden's classes, and he encouraged them to make paintings using traditional motifs. At first they painted on small composition boards, but between 1977 and 1979, they moved from these small works to large-scale canvases. Old Mick Giacomara's painting Honey Ant Dreaming 
depicts the landscape of Papunya Tula itself, where honey ants live in abundance. The ants store nectar in their distended abdomens and hang from the ceilings of underground chambers, sometimes for months, until the ant colony needs their stored food. Here, the concentric circles represent three honey ant colony sites, and the U-shaped forms around them represent people digging at the sites. The softly curved shapes represent hills or ridges. The black-stemmed plant is native to the region and is used to make pigment for designs etched on the ground during honey ant dreaming ceremonies. Form and meaning. How does form contribute to the meaning of a work of art? As mentioned above, abstract works of art that did not refer to the natural or objective world at all are sometimes called non-objective. One example, Kazimir Malevich's Black Square, is concerned primarily with questions of form. Form, the literal shape and mass of an object or figure, more generally, the materials used to make work of art, the ways in which these materials are used in terms of formal elements, lines, light, color, etc., and the composition that results. When we speak of a work's form, we mean everything from the materials used to make it to the way it employs the various formal elements, discussed in Group 2, to the ways in which those elements are organized into a composition. Composition, the organization of, a for, of the formal elements in a work of art. Form is the overall structure of a work of art. Somewhat misleadingly, it is generally opposed to content, which is what the work of art expresses or means. Obviously, the content of non-objective art is its form, but all forms, Malevich well knew, suggest meaning. Malevich's painting is really about the relation between the black square and the white ground behind it. By 1912, the Russian artist was engaged, he wrote, in a desperate attempt to free art from the ballast of objectivity. To this end, he says... I took refuge in the square. He called his new art suprematism, defining it as the supremacy of feeling in art. He opposed feeling, that is, to objectivity, or the disinterested representation of reality. Black Square was first exhibited in December 1915 at an exhibition in Petrograd entitled 0.10, The Last Futurist Exhibition of Paintings. The exhibition's name refers to the idea that each of the ten artists participating in the show were seeking to articulate the zero degree, that is, the irreducible core, of painting. What, in other words, most minimally makes a painting? In this particular piece, Malevich reveals that in relation, these apparently static forms, two squares, a black one set on a white one, are energized in a dynamic tension. At the 0.10 exhibition, Black Square was placed high in the corner of the room, in the position usually reserved in traditional Russian houses for religious icons. The work is, in part, parodic, replacing images designed to invoke deep religious feeling with what Malevich referred to as an altogether new and direct form of representation of the world of feeling. As he wrote in his treatise, The Non-Objective World, the square equals feeling. The white field equals the void beyond this feeling. What feeling this might be remains unstated, that is, totally abstract. The work of contemporary Brazilian artist Beatriz Milhazes is likewise founded upon formal relationships. Carambola, like all of her work, is based on the square, and not coincidentally, she counts Malevich among those whose work has most influenced her own. She begins each work with a square, and then she says, I build things on top of it. The squares may disappear, but they are still a reference for me to think about composition. In fact, she thinks of the circles that dominate paintings like Carambola as containing squares. In essence, she pulls together into a geometrical composition the shapes and forms of Brazilian culture, ornate church facades, the ruffled blouses of Brazilian Mardi Gras costumes, the design of the serpentine walkway that stretches along her native Rio de Janeiro's beachfront, the exotic plants in the botanical garden neighboring her studio in Rio, where, in fact, the carambola tree, from which this painting takes its name, grows. 
or color two, captures the dizzying kaleidoscope of Brazilian carnival. I'm interested in conflict, she says. And the moment you add one more color, you start the conflict, which is endless. So there is a constant movement to your eyes, to yourself, to your body. And I like it. Convention, Symbols, and Interpretation How do cultural conventions, the use of symbols and iconography, inform the meaning of works of art? Our understanding of Milhase's work is highly dependent on understanding its cultural context. Consider another set of examples, an ancient sculpture of the Greek god Apollo and a carved mask from the Sang tribe of Gabon in West Africa. In the late 1960s, in his television series and book, Civilization, art historian Kenneth Clark compared the two images through an ethnocentric lens and concluded that the image of the messenger god Apollo demonstrated the superiority of classical Greek civilization. Clark understood the conventions of Greek sculpture and recognized the meaning of the idealized sculptural form. Quote, To the Hellenistic imagination, it is a world of light and confidence, in which the gods are like ourselves, only more beautiful, and ascend to earth in order to teach men reason and the laws of harmony. However, his interpretation of the African mask, which he owned, reveals his ignorance of the conventions of the West African nation that created it. Quote, To the Negro imagination, it is a world of fear and darkness, ready to inflict horrible punishment for the smallest infringement of a taboo. End quote. In fact, the features of the African mask are exaggerated, at least in part to separate it from the real. Clark's ethnocentric reading of it neglects its ritual, celebratory social function in African society. Worn in ceremonies, masks are seen as vehicles through which the spirit world is made available to humankind. Cultural conventions are often carried forward from one generation to the next by means of iconography. Paulo Belvedere, Roman copy after the flood. This is the African dancing mask from Oliveira, Oliveira Lake, Tanganyika, Tanganyika. A system of visual images, the meaning of which is widely worn in ceremonies, masks are seen as vehicles through which the spirit world is made available to humankind. Cultural conventions are often carried forward from one generation to the next by means of iconography. Iconography, study or description of images and symbols. A system of visual images, the meaning of which is widely understood by a given culture or cultural group. These visual images are symbols. Images that represent something more than their literal meaning. That is, they represent something more than their literal meaning. The subject matter of iconographic images is not obvious to any viewer unfamiliar with the symbolic system in use. Furthermore, every culture has its specific iconographic practices, its own system of images that are understood by the culture at large to mean specific things. Even within a culture, the meaning of an image may change or be lost over time. When Jan van Eyck painted his portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife Giovanna Sinami in 1434, its repertoire of visual images was well understood, but today much of its meaning is lost on the average viewer. For example, the bride's green dress, a traditional color for weddings, was meant to suggest her natural fertility. She is not pregnant. Her swelling stomach was a convention of female beauty at the time, and her dress is structured in a way that accentuates it. The groom's removal of his shoes is a reference to God's commandment to Moses to take off his shoes when standing on holy ground. A single candle burns in the chandelier above the couple, symbolizing the presence of Christ at the scene. And the dog, as most of us recognize even today, is associated with faithfulness and in this context particularly with marital fidelity. But what would Islamic culture make of
he was talking about this the dog in the Van Eyck painting. As in the Muslim world, dogs are traditionally viewed as filthy and degraded. From the Muslim point of view, the painting verges on nonsense. And for almost everyone viewing Van Eyck's work more than 500 years after it was painted, certain elements remain confusing. An argument has recently been made, for instance, that Van Eyck is not representing a marriage so much as a betrothal or engagement. We have assumed for generations that the couple stands in a bridal chamber where, after the ceremony, they will consummate their marriage. It turns out, however, that in the 15th century it was commonplace for Flemish homes to be decorated with hung beds with canopies. Called furniture of a state, they were important status symbols commonly displayed in the principal room of the house as a sign of the owner's prestige and influence. It was also widely understood in Van Eyck's time that a touching of the hands, the woman laying her hand, in the palm of a man, was the sign, especially in front of witnesses, of a mutual agreement to wed. The painter himself stands in witness to the event. On the back wall, above the mirror, are the words Jan de Eyck Fjord 1434. Jan van Eyck was here. Oh, right there. Right there. Okay. 1434. We see the backs of Arnold Feeney and his wife reflected in the mirror, and beyond them, standing more or less in the same place as we do as viewers, two other figures, one a man in a red turban, who is probably the artist himself. In his painting Charles I, Jean-Michel Basquiat employs iconographic systems both of his own and others' making. The painting is an homage to the great jazz saxophonist Charlie Parker, who died in 1955, one of a number of black cultural heroes celebrated by the graffiti-inspired Basquiat. The iconography of the painting is examined in depth in the closer look. If the icon... Basquiat's Charles I. Charles I by Jean-Michel Basquiat is an homage to the great jazz saxophonist Charlie Parker, one of a number of black cultural heroes celebrated by the graffiti-inspired Basquiat. Son of a middle-class Brooklyn family, his father was a Haitian-born accountant. His it, look, there's the, the, the S that, like, for some reason, everyone started making the, the little S thing, but this looks like it's not complete or not done right. <laughs> his mother of black know. Puerto Rican. I don't know what that S was for anyways, but look, it looks right here. There's another S and that S, S, S. Superman? I, I don't remember what the S was supposed to be about, but I don't know. Basquiat left school in 1977 at age 17, living on the streets of New York for several years, during which time he developed the tag, or graffiti pin name, Samo, a combination of Sambo and same old shit. Samo was most closely associated with a three-pointed crown as self-anointed king of the graffiti artists, and the word tar evoking racism as in Tar Baby, Violence, Tar and Feathers, which he would entitle a painting in 1982, and through the anagram, The Art World, as well. A number of his paintings exhibited in the 1981 New York New Wave exhibit at an alternative art gallery across the 59th Street Bridge from Manhattan attracted the attention of several art dealers, and his career exploded. The price of a halo at 59 cents suggests that martyrdom is for sale, in Basquiat's world. Beneath the crown that Basquiat had introduced in his Samo years is a reference to Thor, the Norse god. Below it, the Superman logo, and above it, a reference to the X-Men comic book heroes. I knew it! Superman. That's what the S is for. Not gang-related at all. Okay. Thor. X-Men. Thor is also a Marvel comic book hero. The X in Basquiat's work is never entirely negative. 
In Henry Dreyfus's Symbol Source Book, An Authoritative Guide to International Graphic Symbols, Basquiat discovered a section on hobo signs, marks left graffiti-like by hobos to inform their brethren about the lay of the local land. In this graphic language, an X means, okay, all right. This phrase, especially the crossed-out word young, suggests Basquiat's sense of his own martyrdom. In fact, four months before his 28th birthday in 1988, he would become the victim, according to the medical examiner's report, of acute mixed drug intoxication, opiates, cocaine. The S, especially crossed out, also suggests dollars. Marvel Comics is, of course, a reference to the king of the superhero comic books. They are also publishers of the X-Men series, whom Marvel describes as follows. Born with strange powers, the mutants known as the X-Men use their awesome abilities to protect a world that hates and fears them. Beneath the word opera, and apparently on a par with the most aristocratic of musical genres, is the title of one of Parker's greatest tunes, Cherokee, topped by four feathers in honor of Parker's nickname, Bird. The hand probably represents the powerful hand of the musician, and equally the painter. That's it. Basquiat's Charles the First. Exit this shit. Um, there we go. Escape. The graphic program of the Arnolfini double portrait seems remote, and Basquiat's somewhat personal. The iconographic practices of other cultures are even more so. While most of us in the West probably recognize a Buddha when we see one, we do not necessarily understand that the position of the Buddha's hands carries iconographic significance. Buddhism, which originated in India in the 4th century BCE, is traditionally associated with the worldly existence of Sakyamuni or Gautama, the sage of the Sakya clan, who lived and taught around 500 BCE. In his 35th year, Sakyamuni experienced enlightenment under a tree at Gaya near modern Patna and became the Buddha or enlightened one. Buddhism spread to China in the 1st and 2nd centuries CE. Long before it reached Japan by way of Korea in about 600 CE, it had developed a more or less consistent iconography, especially related to the representation of the Buddha himself. The symbolic hand gestures or mudra refer both to general states of mind and to specific events in the life of the Buddha. The mudra, best known to Westerners, the hands folded in the seated Buddha's lap, symbolizes meditation. The wooden sculpture of the Amida Buddha illustrated here was assembled from multiple wood blocks and then hollowed out to make it lighter and more portable. The Buddha of infinite light, whom the Japanese call Amida, was believed to rule the pure land, or paradise in the West, into which the faithful might find themselves reborn, thus gaining release from the endless cycle of birth, rebirth, and suffering. The critical process, thinking about visual conventions. Very rarely can we find the same event documented from the... How far are we on this? Oh, we're almost done. This one was a short chapter. Group two, group one, what is this? Group one, one and two, group two, this, group three, okay, that's weird. Don't know how that works out, but whatever, we're almost finished with this one. This one was long. All right, critical process. Let's go back, press play. The point of view of two different cultures. But two images, one by John Taylor 
a journalist hired by Leslie's Illustrated Gazette, and the other by the Native American artist Howling Wolf, son of the Cheyenne chief Eaglehead, both depict the October 1867 signing of a peace treaty between the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, and Comanche peoples and the United States government at Medicine Lodge Creek, a tributary of the Arkansas River in Kansas. Taylor's illustration is based on sketches done at the scene, and it appeared soon after the events. Howling Wolf's work, actually one of several depicting the events, was done nearly a decade later, after he was taken east and imprisoned at Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida, together with his father and 70 other ringleaders of the continuing Native American insurrection in the Southern Plains. While in prison, Howling Wolf made many such ledger drawings, so called because they were executed on blank accountants' ledgers. Even before he was imprisoned, Howling Wolf had actively pursued ledger drawing. As Native Americans were introduced to crayons, ink, and pencils, the ledger drawing supplanted traditional buffalo hide art. But in both the hide paintings and the later ledger drawings, artists depicted the brave accomplishments of their owners. Treaty signing at Medicine Lodge. That's a good as drawing. Howling Wolf Treaty signing at Medicine Lodge. Okay, where is it at now? Critical process. All right. Thinking back, 2.1. Describe the relationship between words and images. Both images and words can refer to things that we see or experience in the world, but they are not the things themselves. Nevertheless, things that we see or experience in the world and images. Both images and words can refer to things that we see or experience in the world, but they are not. Thinking back, 2.1. Describe the relationship between words and images. Both images and words can refer to things that we see or experience in the world, but they are not the things themselves. Nevertheless, words help us to explain what we see or experience and are fundamental to visual literacy. If an artwork's subject matter might be readily apparent articulating its content, what the artwork fully means, requires that we use words. How can the subject matter of Shirin Nashat's rebellious silence be distinguished from its content? Why do you suppose calligraphy is held in such high esteem in Islam? 2.2. Distinguish between representation and abstraction. Representational artworks portray recognizable forms. The more the representation resembles what the eye sees, the more it is said to be an example of realism. What does Albert Bierstadt represent in his painting Puget Sound on the Pacific Coast? What distinguishes naturalism from other types of realism? How does representational art differ from abstract art? 2.3. Discuss how form, as opposed to content, might also help us to understand the meaning of a work of art. Form is the overall structure of an artwork. It includes such aspects of the artwork's materials and the organization of its parts into a composition. What role does form typically play in non-objective art? How does form differ from content? How do Kazimir Milevich and Beatrice Milhazes use form in their works? 2.4. Explain how cultural conventions can inform our interpretation of works of art. Cultural conventions are often carried from one generation to the next through iconography. Iconography is a system of images whose meaning is understood by a certain cultural group. The images used in iconography represent concepts or beliefs beyond literal subject matter. What cultural conventions used in Jan van Eyck's Giovanni Annofini and his wife have we apparently forgotten? How does Jean-Michel Basquiat's Charles I represent a personal iconography? What is a mudra?
flashcards and shit so you can learn the vocabulary terms group 2 the formal elements and their design so what is this let's see how long this is not not that long let's do it fuck it Group 2, the formal elements and their design, describing the art you see. Upon first encountering Paul Zizan's The Basket of Apples, most people sense immediately that it is full of what appear to be visual mistakes. The painting is a still life, but it is also a complex arrangement of visual elements, lines and shapes, light and color, space, and despite the fact that it is a still life, time. The edges of the table, both front and back, do not line up. The wine bottle is tilted sideways, and the apples appear to be spilling forward, out of the basket, onto the white napkin, which in turn you know seems to project forward look at the out picture, of the picture. Group two, the formal the elements and their design, describing the art you see. Upon first encountering Paul Zizan's The Basket of Apples, most people sense immediately that it is full of what appear to be visual mistakes. The painting is a still life, but it is also a complex arrangement of visual elements, lines and shapes, light and color, space, and despite the fact that it is a still life, time. The edges of the table, both front and back, do not line up. The wine bottle is tilted sideways, and the apples appear to be spilling forward, out of the basket, onto the white napkin, which in turn seems to project forward out of the picture plane. Indeed, looking at this work, one feels compelled to reach out and catch that first apple as it rolls down the napkin's central fold and falls into our space. In truth, Cezanne has not made any mistakes at all. Each decision is part of a strategy designed to give back life to the traditional form of the still life, a genre of painting that has as its subject objects of the table, such as food, dishes, and flowers, and which in French is called nature morte, dead nature. He wants to animate the picture plane, to make its space dynamic rather than static, to engage the imagination of the viewer. He has taken the visual elements of line, space, and texture, and has deliberately manipulated them as part of his composition, the way he has chosen to organize the canvas. As we begin in this section to appreciate how the visual elements routinely function, we will better appreciate how Cezanne manipulates them to achieve the wide variety of effects that so animate this painting. Chapter three, line. All right. Let's close this bitch down. All right, you guys, that's going to be it for this um, stream. I'll probably stream later on when I do my assignments for a different class. Uh, after I'm finished with all the assignments, I'm going to get, uh, if I have time, I will get back on Star Citizen or a different game, depending on which game you guys want to play. If not, then I'll be on Star Citizen. Uh, someone's calling. I have no idea who that is. They can leave a voicemail. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for watching, subscribe and, uh, follow all my channels. That's YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. Uh, you can find me by searching Teleco 760, like it says here on my, oh, okay, Teleco 760, T-E-L-I-C-O 760, or 760. So you guys look at the links on the about section, you'll find all the channel links including the merch, my online merch store link where you could buy this tank top, basically my oh shit, ch uh, my oh shit collection and my logo collection. Um, other than that, you guys want some custom designs, words, phrases, um, on different materials. So it could be tank tops, shirts, hoodies, sweaters without the hoodie, uh, caps, uh, hats, mugs and plates just basically anything merch 
any merchandise that you guys can think of just hit me up and then i could get it made for you guys and um if you guys see me like playing video games or whatever and i have those shirts on you guys can order those shirts too just hit me up either through discord my instagram uh dm me there and my email address and you guys let me know what you guys want and whichever size whichever color it's all unisex it's good to go thank you guys for watching